Hello and welcome to our latest instalment of our Python Live webinar series here at Amicus Recruitment. Um, for those of you who don't know who Amicus Recruitment are, we specialise in recruiting across three key areas of IT, which are Python and machine learning, Golang and JavaScript. Myself, I'm Jordan Hayward, and I specialise in recruiting across the Python and machine learning market across London. Today, we've got a brilliant webinar planned with AI expert and enthusiast, Mihail, Mihail Morrison. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right there. Please forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, Mihail, you are the tech lead over at FinTech, the FinTech company Thought Machine. Um, I know you'll be giving us a brilliant talk today, um, an introduction to AI, genetic programming, genetic algorithms, and we'll be giving us some really good examples from personal experiences as well. Um, and we're aiming to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so I'd like to inform everyone that at the bottom of your screen, a lot of you have already found it, but there's a, a Q&A tab and also a chat tab at the bottom. So feel free throughout the entire webinar to post as many questions as you want. Um, we want to make it as interactive as possible. I know I've got my part to play as well, um, as Mihail has warned me. So um, yeah, it should be a good one. So put as many questions as you want in there um, and either myself or Mihail will get through those questions throughout the evening. Probably Mihail because they're going to be technical questions, I hope. <laughs> um, one final thing, um, Mihail's kindly shared the, uh, a link to myself um, for the slides for this evening's webinar. So what I'll do as I hand over to Mihail, I'll stick that link into the chat box. Um, and if you want to get that, those up on your own screen whilst Mihail is running through the webinar, um, feel free to do so. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much enough from me. Um, so let's get started, Mihail. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. How are you? Thank you, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. No I always love sharing knowledge and I always learn, love learning about new things. So yeah. hopefully everyone in the audience will get a chance to get out of this with at least one bit of interesting tidbit of information or maybe a new passion. Who knows? Absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. The, so as um, Jordan kindly introduced me, I'm Mihail. I'm a tech lead manager at Thought Machine. It's, one, it's an exciting fintech in London. Many of you might have heard of it, especially if you work there right now and are in the audience. So <laughs> mildly biased in that regard. But before Thought Machine, I was a PhD student and then a doctor of machine learning, particularly genetic algorithms. And it's a topic that many in the industry are not very familiar with. And I love just introducing people to it because I'm going to start with it and I'm going to end with this. All algorithms, all languages, all tools, they're literally just bits and pieces that you add to your arsenal that you can then use when you identify problems, but you don't have to use them everywhere. There is not just one algorithm. There is not just one programming languages, language. They're all valuable, all useful, and identifying when something might be good and just being aware of it can be the lifesaver for your company. So today's topic is, can AI balance a video game better than a human game designer? How many of you have played games? I would imagine at least a few of you. Jordan, have you ever played games in your life? Yeah, yeah, plenty, especially when I was a kid. And were they hard, easy games? Did you think they were? They should have changed in some way or another? Um, some were easier than others. Um, there's, I think there's always tweaks for games that, that can be made to improve them, make them better quality, make them easier. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's not a hard science. What one person finds an easy and fun game, another person might find too hard, or vice versa. Some games are not meant to be played by other people, by many people, by the designer's choice. Not, not everyone will agree with that, but that's the whole point of art. You create something that might be accessible to some, might inspire different sentiments in others. So can AI do a designer's job better than they can? And the answer is no, no, they can't. Thank you for joining us, me and Jordan are here at the live series today. I truly hope you love today's presentation and that you've learned something new about the bad jokes aside. No. <laughs> the idea is that let's start with the very basics. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is just code. It's just some sort of code that solves a problem, tries to get a solution out of one of your tasks. And one thing that you might have noticed while looking at job offerings or in the media, especially, 
it's also a buzzword where we've used AI to improve this thing and we've used AI to improve that thing. A lot of the times it's true and a lot of the time it's not. The general idea that you need to remember, it's code. It behaves based on how people program it, how they work with it. And sometimes what looks like AI isn't and vice versa. You'd be surprised at what people think is not AI when it actually manages to learn and discover patterns that no one else was, has been able to do it beforehand as a human. Is AI useful? Everyone, people like me will say yes, because we're biased, but trying to detach myself from the whole, I'm a person that does AI, you can realize that AI can be taught a lot of specialist tasks, things that we as humans might already be really good or things that we as humans might not be that good or need a lot of training. The best example I can give is, let's say, recognizing objects in an image. Jordan, are you good at recognizing what is a dog and what is a cat? I'd like to think so, yeah. Exactly, and I think our audience would agree most of them will be good at recognizing different animals and telling them apart. At least at the you know, top level, I can't say I can take, I tell apart different types of cats. I don't even know different types of cats. But an AI system, for example, that used to be a fairly hard problem. And even to this day, a lot of these systems are not very good. But they are getting better. More training data, more be better systems being put on. But that's the thing. AI is extremely good at niche tasks. You give it something that has a very clear solution or is a very narrow area, like identifying, is this a dog or is this a cat? And you'll be able to come up with a system, an AI system, that is extremely good at making, getting the difference between the two. And they will actually be able to sometimes discover patterns that humans have never been able to come up with. Or if they did, they never published and they were never recognized. We know that history is not always kind or different areas have not been able to emphasize the great results of different people. But here's some examples of AI technologies. Neural networks, they're very popular. They're used for image recognition. They're used for sound synthesizing where, or voice recognition. They're extremely good. They are based on the human brain and they try to emulate in some respect, as much as the digital world allows it, how the human brain works. Now, Jordan, can you tell me what the problem is with that statement I just made? About how the human brain works. Exactly. You're right, Jordan, you're on the money. We as humans don't yet understand how the human brain works completely. We're there, we're, we're getting there. But if we don't understand it completely, how are we going to emulate it? <laughs> so there's obviously different systems, different approaches to that. And it's challenging. But these are the most popular right now because they've been able to, with the evolution of uh, the power that any, just the usual, the PC I have right there is infinitely more powerful than the PC even a big university had 15 or 20 years ago. So even a hobbyist like me can play around with extremely strong neural networks that can generate great things, right, uh, recognizing writing, speech, and so on, all done in a few minutes based on some training data that I threw at it. Similar is natural language processing, being able to look at text and identify what does the text mean. For us as humans, it makes sense. We learn language based on our interactions with society. But when I say time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, that's confusing to a human because fruit flies, they like a banana, not that fruit flies like a banana. But then you give that to a computer and it goes, I guess, yes, I'll trust you about it. And that's, and that's where NLP comes in identifying the niche scenarios, translating things, identifying sentiment. Okay, this person posted a review on insert very popular marketing website here. Were they positive about it? Were they negative about it? Okay, I could manually look at it or I could go through the millions of reviews automatically and maybe get a few wrong. But that's way better than spending hundreds and thousands of hours. There are also heuristic decision makers that, for example, look up into the future and try to see, okay, if I would do this, then this might happen, which has been extremely popular in chess, for example, where you try to go into the future and see and simulate what could happen. And that's expensive in its own way, where you go, well, simulating the real world is 
complicated, but when the task is cheap, you can try it out again. There's decision trees where you simply looking at all the past data that you have, you say, well, if I go this way based on this decision, maybe I, sh I will be more successful than if I go this other way. And finally, genetic algorithms, which I'll be covering in more detail today. And if any of you are curious, Jordan has shared the link and he'll be sharing it again if any of you have missed it. There are some links here to some intro level ideas for each of these items, except genetic algorithms, those will follow. Now, don't hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A. Both I and Jordan will be looking over them. And we are more than happy to stop at any point and answer anything that pops up. I see there are no open questions yet, so let's keep going. Now, Jordan, you've already seen the slide, so this is already cheating, but <laughs> can you name an example of AI in your day-to-day -day life? AI in my day-to-day -day life? Uh, one of the biggest ones, probably Netflix recommendations. That's a great one. Yeah. What would we do without them? And funnily enough, that's the sort of AI that's, a reinforcement learning system, which I didn't actually mention earlier. Reinforcement simply says, okay, if Jordan likes the crown and Jordan likes CSI, then people that like the crown might also like CSI if we see more people like Jordan. So we can safely recommend one if they like the other. A few other examples are smart thermostats. They keep, you keep telling them what you want the temperature to be at any given time. And over time they'll keep learning, oh, if this is the temperature outside and this is the situation inside, I should put it to this. Or I can save electricity by only turning it on for a few minutes and then turning it off because that will still be comfortable while keeping the electricity costs down. You have forward-thinking transport companies and their timetabling. Imagine a small city like, let's say, Coventry. And that's already hell to try and synchronize all of the buses to offer the best transport for the people of Coventry. Now take it up, up a level and think London. How many bus lines does London have? I don't know the answer, but I think it's big. And using AI, you can come up with potentially better solutions to that. And a lot of companies already do that. You have energy companies and the distribution networks. A lot of the problems that transport companies face can be moved to how you distribute electricity across the entire country or maybe even a continent. And we've seen how that can go badly. Take a look at Texas earlier this year. Not quite related into the distribution side of things, but it probably didn't help either, it being an antiquated system. Then a simple chatbot for ordering pizza. How horrible, like Jordan, how horrible would it be if you ordered a pizza via the chatbot and you got a completely different order? It'd be pretty frustrating. Might be good. Exactly. Might be good, but nine times out of ten, it would probably be very frustrating. Exactly. I mean, even when it's good, you, the instinct was, but this is not what I ordered. I'm happy that it ended up being a good thing, but it can't go any worse than that. Siri, Google Assistant, Cortana, Alexa, Bixby, all of these are also examples of AI in day-to-day -day life. And not just a single system. Cortana, Alexa, Bixby, Google Assistant, all of them. They are not just one little system that does all of the tasks. They're one system that communicates with multiple other systems and AI technologies that do other bits and pieces. Then say, yes, I succeeded. Oh, well, great. And reports accordingly. So many systems are involved in this. It's, I would not be, want to be one of the people managing the success rate of one of these uh, home assistants. <laughs> Stores arranging their products to make you buy more. I actually remember reading a paper about this where there were big brands trying to look into, okay, what do people buy the most? But then trying different bits and pieces, identifying the patterns, and then using some of these machine learning algorithms to say, well, if we put these things closer to these other things, sales of both soar or sales of these ones soar. And funnily enough, this was based on an older popular bit of knowledge, which became true. Was they confirmed it to be true, and then I didn't explore whether there's more. Why do you think gum is so often right next to the register when you're paying? Because people were like, oh, I wasn't thinking about gum right now, but now that I'm paying, why not just put a bit of gum there? Because no, 
actually, like Jordan or anyone in the audience, how often have any of you gone to the store just to buy gum? Can't say I ever have, to be honest. It's always an impulse buy. It's always when exactly. you're for petrol. Exactly. And this does not apply to just gum. Many other things have results to, resulted of identifying where these relationships live. Facebook timeline. Again, what sort of news is being shown to you? And again, this is a point of major contention because it often creates those bubbles that you've seen a lot of researchers uh, and then the media exploding, in this case, with a lot of truth, trying to show you things that you will engage with, that you will like, that you will want to click on because that's what they want. They want more engagement. And if you're, not going, if you're just not going to skip over things, they don't want it there. How do they learn what sort of things you'll click on? A lot of natural language processing, a lot of AI technology. Self-driving cars, I can't wait for the day where I can just get in a self-driving car, not have to think about it and <laughs> be somewhere. Are you excited about it, Jordan? Very excited. I've uh, yeah, dream of the day that happens. <laughs> hate driving. <laughs> Same. The funny bit about self-driving cars is the day this becomes available to everyone, like this, it, the problem with it becoming available to everyone now is human drivers. If we just removed, uh, this allowed humans to drive and just moved completely to self-driving cars, it would be nirvana, paradise. <laughs> it would be perfect. It's the period in between, which is the worst. <laughs> the most and dangerous. Uh, exactly. And more. Roger asks about AI examples in financial sectors. This is where I'm not personally uh, f uh, aware of a lot of them. I know some companies are using AI technologies to identify fraud, where they look at periods of time when allegedly no fraud happened and a lot of people audited all the transactions, all the happenings, and said everything was fine. And using that as a validation for when fraud does happen, being able to identify it despite the massive stream of data coming in. Also, uh, set, uh, patterns in people's buying, being able to give them advice, predicting a lot of the um, their costs over time. That's also been a use case, although AI is a good solution for that particular use case, not the best one. There are just as good approaches as far as I'm aware. I could be proven wrong about this, where you could just use some mathematical formulas and base it on that. So from a financial sector point of view, I'm certain it's being used, but uh, I can't tell you any more than that, sadly. And who knows, maybe a lot of the use cases are one of military secrets that uh, banks never want to tell you about because <laughs> then other banks will find out and use them. Now, is AI dangerous? The problem with AI is, like I've said, it can do a lot of things way better than humans can. Can it aim a sniper a kilometer away and accurately shoot someone out of a crowd much better than a human could? Could it identify people and their travel patterns? See all the debacles with different police agencies around the world getting access to face recognition. Can they track where you've gone during your entire trip without needing access to your phone data? Yes, it can. But on its own, no. As a tool in the hands of someone malicious, for sure. Like I said, those examples earlier can result in a lot of pain and suffering for the people of that society. But can anyone, if I decide to become an evil villain right now, can I use AI to just wreak havoc upon the world? No, not without a lot of resources, not without a lot of expertise, knowledge and understanding of how that gets to be used. Going back to the police example, they have the data and they can track someone, but if they don't know how to use that information, then it doesn't mean anything. Now, can AI take control of creator of AI? From Roger, I don't know. This is where there is a lot of work on brain computer interfaces, but right now it's all read only, where the systems try to understand what you're thinking about. But I've not seen any we're going backwards, where they're trying to tell you what you're thinking about. Although, advertising might be really interested in that. I can definitely see the advertising... Uh, in, uh, Jordan, what's the word when... Not department, but the advertising world Marketing. of hiring. 
you mean? Marketing, sure. sure. They would really love to be able to plant thoughts into people's minds. Um, but we're not there yet, as far as I know, according to academic research at this point in time that I'm aware of. Who knows? Maybe the uh, military has something hidden around. <laughs> now, is AI smart? Like I've mentioned, for specialized tasks, yes. And there is a lot of research on doing general AI, creating all sorts of Shodan systems or Skynet, but we're not there yet. The moment you ask an AI system to do more than two or three things at a time and do all of them in a smart way, they degrade quite immensely. And general AI, like the ones you've seen in movies, we're very, very, very far away, despite what some multi, multi billionaires would tell you. Very, very far away. Jordan, how far away? Very, very, very far away. Correct. Very far <laughs> away. If at all possible on our planet. Right now, obviously that will change over time. We keep coming up with better systems, better hardware. But at this point in time, the resources we have on planet Earth should not be enough to create a general AI without more and more research coming in. Now, I want to talk about easy solutions and hard journeys because we're entering the chapter of this presentation where we talk about genetic algorithms. Easy solutions are when you can look at something that tries to solve your problem and say, this is a good idea. Jordan, I need your help now. We yeah. need to schedule some nurses at the hospital. But the problem is, Ahmed needs Fridays off. Bethany must be booked for at most 16 hours each week. Jane is not allowed around hospitals about between 4 and 6 a.m. And so many other requirements. And you need to put them all in a rota. And it has to work for the whole week. And maybe even have some contingencies for some um, people getting sick. How would you solve this problem, Jordan? I'd probably uh, delegate that responsibility to someone else, to be honest. A bit too challenging for my liking. Too many variables. <laughs> that, that is an understatement. That's a lot of variables. And it's a lot of trial and error. And people over history have had these problems. I mean, hospitals are not a new thing. University... Uh, schedules. Jordan, have you ever had a clash in your university schedule? Uh, yeah, 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 a few times. How could that happen? They pay so, people so much to then completely ruin your schedule. Could they not realize there was a clash there? That's just horrible. <laughs> and it's, it's a very hard problem. These is, this is one of the most complicated and yet present problems in society just scheduling things so that everyone is happy so what is an easy solution well in the context of this particular problem well when you look at the schedule you can quickly identify okay well yeah this fits all my requirements this is a good solution or no why did you schedule jane for 4 a.m when clearly she's not allowed to be there between 4 and 6 a.m i can see that that's a wrong thing or you can take a look at Google Maps. You want to go from A to B. Okay, this looks like a sensible route to go from London to Brighton. But then if you see a route that says, oh, you're taking me to Brighton via Edinburgh, you're what, that, that's an obviously bad solution. Why are you taking me via Edinburgh? Especially if it's not well defended, like <laughs> you take a flight and it's quicker. Again, overlapping schedules, you're aware of it. And it Clearly, night, night is day. Or how aerodynamic a car is with a lot of simulations. Once you have the 3D model, you can test that and see, or even maybe make it printed and so on and test it out. And that's where the problem is. Checking that the solution is good is easy. Getting a solution is the hard part. Getting it is where a lot of research comes in. A lot of algorithms that are applied especially for different tasks, you will see a different programs that try to solve the, nurse, the nursing rota problem by greedy systems, by trial and error, by throwing random bits at you until it works or telling you when it's wrong. So you keep trying to do it yourself manually. And then it says, yeah, this is good. No, this isn't. And this is where genetic algorithms come in. Genetic algorithms are evolution, natural evolution, turned into a computer algorithm. They are essentially Darwin's law, but for solutions. 
So let me give you an example. That's an extreme allegory. It might become a bit visual, so I do apologize in advance, but it's after six. A few of you might already have a few beers, so it's all good. <laughs> Think of it as a tiny village filled with people. Each one of these people is a solution to your problem. It's a route on Google Maps. It's a rota. It's a car. But instead of valuing them based on humanly concepts like wealth and fame and so on, how well do they solve your problem? That is what in the world of trend calculus we call fitness. If it solves your problem really well, but it's still missing a few things, it'll be close to perfect, but you'll penalize the bit for the bits that it does wrong. If it's utterly atrocious, it will be just worse. Okay, so I have a few, a village filled with people. What do we do with these people now? Well, we take the best people in the village and we tell them to have kids. What does that mean? they should inherit the best traits from both parents. Because as you can see in the diagram, you have parent A, you have parent B. You take a little bit of A, a little bit of B, you have a brand new solution, and then you check, is it a better fitness? If it's a better fitness, you keep it. It's now a new member of your society that is better than the previous ones. If it's worse, well, you throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, child, this is Sparta. <laughs> we, we, we don't allow for weak, weak uh, solutions to our problems. Alternatively, there's also mutation. Exact. Mutation. Just like in real life, you can have things that suddenly show up out of nowhere. And that's where you take an existing solution and you change something. You just change. The simplest example I can think of is uh, Jane was scheduled at 5 a.m. You change that to 8 a.m. Done. That, that's a small change. And suddenly, it's a different solution altogether. Suddenly, that small change, for example, fits the requirement we had for she shouldn't be in four to six. Completely random. And you keep doing this over and over again. And you can do this a lot of times. Because, like we've mentioned earlier, checking if a solution is good is cheap. So you, you can do that a lot of times. And there is research that my supervisor... Um, was telling me about, and I trusted it essentially because the wording was extremely complicated and it was in my first year of the PhD, it is proven that it should eventually converge to a good solution. You'll have to trust me on that one. <laughs> There's a few links for introductions. Genetic algorithms are the more umbrella approach. Genetic programming, and I wholeheartedly recommend this uh, book. It is written by my supervisor with one of the greatest minds in uh, genetic algorithms, uh, Dr. Professor Koza. The genetic programming essentially works with tree structures, and it can also do things like code or decision trees. You can evolve decision trees or even neural networks from scratch. And that's actually a great approach, and I will actually recommend it in a bit further. So here's an example. Jordan, have you ever used an antenna? Um, maybe for the radio, but yeah. Not, and not like that, no. <laughs> Exactly. Like the, the human assumption was, okay, big stick, more than enough for an antenna. But people were curious, how can we, play, how can we change an antenna to have way better reception for the same amount of material used? These are a few examples that are better than your traditional antenna. There's also cybersecurity. This is a really cool application of genetic algorithms where researchers evolve not just the security measures in identifying people trying to crack in, but also the things trying to crack in. So a side effect of all of this research is they're creating better and better and better system crackers, <laughs> but also better solutions for them at the same time. We also have timetabling, like I've mentioned earlier, rosters, schedules, transports, so on. Great way to just come up with better solutions to what you already have. And let's be honest, it's better to spend a month on this and end up saying, okay, I didn't change anything, rather than changing everything and breaking it even worse. Energy, and another cool way, especially if any of the Unity audience have done 3D printing, you can find work that tries to optimize the way stuff is 3D printed so as to waste you the least amount of material. Because a lot of the time, Actually, Jordan, have you ever done any 3D printing? 
Uh, no, I've been to visit a company that specialise in 3D uh, printing, but never actually done it myself, no. Well, one thing that a lot of people are frustrated with it is a lot of the support structures, they need to be printed such that any of the more fragile bits stand, so can be printed on. And once everything is done, you need to clean them up, remove them, uh, make it shiny and everything. And that's just wasted material if there's a better way of doing it. Medicine, there's been a lot of work using genetic algorithms and genetic programming and coming up with just better medicine, better approaches to vaccination and so on. That is my crowning achievement. It's not my actual work. It's someone who cited me, but was in the medical field and used a little bit, a tiny bit of my research to do something that's actually useful for humanity. So that's my crowning achievement. Medicine can use this as well. And this is one that I think a lot of our audience will be quite excited. Fixing bugs and improving your code base. <laughs> this is actually extremely cool. And I will have a link to the paper that started all this. Like I mentioned earlier, genetic programming works with tree structures. Code by design is most of the time a tree structure, which an if is one way or the other, then they keep going in sequence, which means it can be evolved. It can be changed. Bits and pieces can be moved around. You can take two similar bits of code and turn them together. And the research from Dr. Langdon has him in a production system, code that's actually working in a factory, overnight doing as many changes as possible, testing the code that it still works and does the things it's expected to do. If it's found improvements, let's say a random bit of code that suddenly works a hundred times faster, I think in their, the paper it was about 20 times faster. You can, it can go and say, okay, this is what I propose. A human looks over it, says, this is wonderful. I love it. And they just maybe throw it in or decide this looks absolutely horrible. AI, what, what are you doing? And ignore it because it never actually changed the base system without human intervention. Now, I think we have a bit of time for some questions. Let's see. Why is Jane not allowed around hospitals? Piotr, <laughs> I have bad news. Jane has done some really horrible things, but they only happen between 4 and 6 a.m. So <laughs> we're lucky about that. To learn to use AI, what is a good start? Programming, if you're already familiar with programming, then I would recommend a lot of the material that's available on Khan Academy or there's so many resources out there. Python is a great language to start with for learning the basics as it has a simple path from an idea, trial and error to an end result. Even if it's not a great end result, you will be able to get results quickly to just try out things and explore. And it has a quite the diverse library of resources. I'm biased towards C Sharp. I would recommend a lot of the C Sharp material that's out there as well, especially with the C Sharp developers coming out with their own first party solutions to a lot of machine learning problems. That's again, open source, but it's a harder time to get in compared to Python if you're more on the beginner side of things. And continuing, identify the things that you enjoy. Discover the problems that you like to solve and see which algorithms work for that sort of problem play around with them and b build your repertoire of technology and tools based on that. Start with something you enjoy and then learn the rest. You might discover something that you like even more later on, but again, it's there's no heuristic to that. There's no rule. I can't safely tell you that genetic algorithms are more fun than neural networks or more fun than NLP or more fun than reinforcement learning. They're all great. Uh, let's keep going. Charles asks, there's a lot of crossover direct application between gaming engine optimization techniques and real world system controller logic system identification. Genetic programming is often used in nonlinear control and governing example discovery for, discovery, for example. Do you have a take on this application of GAs and potential shortcomings compared to alternate machine learning optimization tool? I think this is a bit beyond the scope of this presentation today, but the simple solution is, I'm not familiar with the problem itself. I am familiar with game agent optimization but not so much with how that links to the real world. I know there are companies that are actually using this from a more defense standpoint, where they're trying to link as many real world situations with game optimizations and game simulations. Beyond that, 
I can't help much more with that. And one last question, question before we keep going. I've heard people say genetic algorithms are not very viable for non-research use yet. Do you disagree and or see genetic algorithms becoming more powerful over the next decade? I disagree immensely. This is where I truly believe genetic algorithms are ready and have been ready for a long time for non-research use yet. It's The problem is it does require a bit more of an academic approach to it to begin with. This is where neural networks benefited quite a lot from some companies identifying cheap and simple ways of making it accessible, and then anyone can just jump in. Genetic algorithms do not have that missing link of jumping from, oh, it's an academic topic to, oh, I understand it as a layman. And that's where a lot of the challenges come in. I do believe a lot of companies are missing out on just great solutions or better solutions especially ironically enough companies that are using stuff like neural networks because machine learning uh, genetic algorithms can improve your existing neural networks by sheer nature of the neural network being a tree structure and that's a missed opportunity that's free it's there you set it up for during let's say a week you live it and leave it in the background and you will come back a month later to potentially something better not a promise, but potentially. And it, it's free. Well, except for some costs for computation. Cool. I think that's all the questions for now. Don't hesitate to ask more. More than happy to answer. And here's a few links, as I've mentioned, for each of the uh, topics that I've described. Obviously, I am extremely hyped about the code one and a video that I would recommend taking a look. This one, I'm not going to mention much, but it's extremely cool. And it's in video form, so it's a lot more accessible. Now, let's quickly go into my research. What did I do? It's not quite as exciting as some of the other topics, but I really, really like it. It was in using genetic algorithms for both changing the requirements of games and, and the way the games are being played, as well as coming up with different types of agents that fit a designer's requirements. And this is where it's a bit different than what you might see in some academia. I'm not saying better agents. Like I'm not trying to make the best Pac-Man agent. I mean, it's one of the things I was trying to do, but also interesting Pac-Man agents or Pac-Man agents that behave more like a human. However, you're able to define that. And the GIF you see right in front of you, and it is GIF, please. The Pac-Man over there, or Miss Pac-Man, is trying to get as many points as possible without ever going for the power pills, which is extremely complicated. You'll see it sometimes has to suicide because it values losing the game as less punishing than getting a power pill. <laughs> as a random bit of trivia. Also, unofficially, although maybe in a few years I will run for the Guinness Book of Records, I have created the Pac-Man, this Pac-Man player that suicides the fastest. It is reliably the fastest to go and get itself killed. No one else has attempted this before. No one else will likely attempt this because I have the best one out there and it's a futile endeavor and it's also a very big waste of time but i've done it <laughs> because with all the work i did for this pac-man agent the one that avoids power pills i only had to tweak two things a five second change to then have my system come up with the other one and then tweak two more things to come up with what at the time and this was bad timing on my part could have been the best pac-man agent in the world but Microsoft Research went ahead of me and came up with a, a perfect Pac-Man player that will finish the game until it literally, the score goes overflows over uh, the maximum value. Whereas mine could only get about 10,000 points before it lost. So, <laughs> so it would have been the best had that better one not shown up afterwards, <laughs> which is extremely disappointing. It's a great achievement still. <laughs> I'll take it. Again, it was purely as a curiosity. <laughs> a bit of the other bits of, uh, I've done is also changing the game itself to be easier. So with the existing mechanic, with the existing players and everything, saying, okay, how do we change the number of points everyone gives, how fast the ghosts are, how fast Pac-Man is, Miss Pac-Man is, and make it easier or harder for different players of different skill levels within limits. So you don't want to make it too easy or too hard or making your car better in Torx, which we have in the audience, Charles helped quite a lot with that because he understood cars, whereas I didn't. Or making some strategies in StarCraft less strong, less effective 
without completely neutering other strategies, which again, you can make a car slower on, let's say, road by removing its wheels, but you still want it to be good enough on off-road. So that's suddenly not a good solution, removing its wheels altogether. <laughs> and games balance, like I mentioned, requirements. I keep mentioning about requirements. Is being able to define them, tweaking them, ident trying running the solution over and over again, which again, easy solution to some extent, playing the game and ident collecting data and then running it all, and success being, OK, I've not, I've not gotten a good solution to my problem, but I've quickly identified the bad ones as well. And that's extremely important. Being able to just skip the obviously bad ones and identifying the ones that get you closer and closer to what you want. Because the truth is, for some requirements, you will not get a good solution. It might be impossible. I, the very... The best example I can give is you can't make a car that flies really well, regardless of how much you tell the uh, genetic algorithm, make me a car that flies really well <laughs> when you don't give it the tools to actually fly. I think we have a quick question as well. Oh, a couple of questions. Cool. Do GA refactorings require test-driven development? Yes. At its core, that particular area of the research does require test-driven development. There, and this is in reference to evolving code making it more performant, or the side effect that I've mentioned is, let's say automated systems or humans identify a new scenario that behaves incorrectly. It can result in a new test, which in the existing system is a failed test. It's a red test. So suddenly, your system is not evolving just against the existing tests, but the new test as well. So it might even find a change that keeps all the tests green or turns them all green to begin with. It's not easy. It's a lot of the times, I do remember a presentation from Dr. Langdon. He didn't mention that there were days where even though there were a couple of red tests in the system, the, the genetic algorithm could not come up with anything. But those were again, not they, they were not as often as you to make the system useless. Quite a lot of the times it would come up with a patch a human would tweak it because, again, an AI will come up with variable names like A72BZG, and you do not know what that is. But it's definitely test-driven development at this time. Could you elaborate at all on the methodology for the StarCraft balancing and the results? Elevator pitch, yes. The general idea was anything that's a number in StarCraft could be changed. You could have the attack damage of all the units, the Zerglings, the Marines, how long they take to build, how much health they have. And those are all things that you can change. And the best example I can give is, literally, you have the default game scenario. The Marines' attack damage is 7, and their health is 40. And you have another solution, which is 6 and 41. Crossover could be, suddenly you have a solution that is 7 and 41, or mutate and change it from 41 to 105. You play around with those, you try to see, OK, these scenarios, these changes suddenly make the game too hard, too easy. This strategy now is even stronger with these changes or completely neutered. And you can keep going forward from there. You can identify saying, OK, changing the health of Marines is completely useless. So you can remove that from the system of things that are being changed or widen the range that is getting changed by. And that's not just. StarCraft, absolutely anything that's numeric can be involved in this way, as long as you have the way of simulating and gathering those requirements and being able to assess, OK, this is really close to my requirements or this isn't really close to my requirements. I hope that answers your question, Pete. And Anonymous asks, how do you go about selecting the parameters genes to use with genetic algorithm? Is it completely situation dependent or are there some generally applicable procedures or approaches that tend to work well? And this is the challenge. This is indeed the problem with the leap from academia to the real world is both the requirements and the things that you're changing need some sort of expert opinion on the topic. You need your designer to say, these are the things that are sensible or we are okay with changing. This is how much we're okay with changing them. And then saying, how do I define success? How do I say this is a good solution? For a trip, 
for example, from on Google Maps, it could be, it should be no longer than twice the direct line between the two points, right? Allegedly. Or, and any solutions that are worse than that, we penalize a bit more because sometimes they don't exist. Sometimes you literally have to go around an entire gulf to get from A to B. Or literally, if you're familiar with the uh, Emirates airline in um, the east of London, you can have a straight line from the O2 to the other side of the um, river. You cannot get there on a straight line. You have to go all around the whole area via either tram or underground to get there. But you penalize anything that could have gotten there but didn't. And it's not an easy task, especially when the person deciding these things, let's say the game designer or the architect in your company, doesn't understand why they need those and why they need to be a bit more precise than expected because the wider the search space, the longer it takes to actually get to something that makes sense. Cool. I think that's all questions for now. Again, keep them coming if you have them because we're almost at the end. Like I promised at the start, it ends the way it starts with a reminder that even though genetic algorithms are cool and they solve so many problems and you have to trust me that they're great and ready for industry, despite again, not quite as high adoption as other AI technologies, they are just a tool. They are in your arsenal. You're now aware of them and you can identify when and how they're useful and valuable. Because as a great person that I did not quote say, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And one last bit of trivia. As a result of all my research, I did one extra bit of work on making genetic algorithms faster, just raw speed, regardless of the task they're evolving, by using other AI systems like neural networks and decision trees to help out the genetic algorithm to go faster. Because sometimes identifying a bad solution is cheaper than actually running it and saying that it's a bad solution. And that came going goes back to StarCraft where running, let's say 50 games of StarCraft on a machine in parallel still took a couple of minutes. So if I can have a system say in 10 milliseconds, this is gonna be horrible, don't even do it. I would prefer for that to skip the two minutes of computation. And thank you all for listening. You can find me on LinkedIn or over there, or I don't actually know where it's pointing. Uh, Jordan, can you help me with that? Where should I be pointing for the slides? Uh, for the link? My right, this way. You probably, <laughs> I'm not too sure your end, but um, yeah, my right, I think. Okay, okay, cool. So, okay, one question. What's your thoughts on GAs versus reinforcement learning for exploring state spaces? Yeah, effectiveness in finding global solutions rather than local. That's actually a problem for both systems. And there's been quite a lot of research into having both genetic algorithms. Okay, let's go back to something else. Both uh, systems if avoiding local minimas or maximas. Let's go with maximas because maxima sounds nicer. And if they get into one, escaping them to keep going towards global maximas. And for context, a local and a global maxima is where you find a solution where everything around it seems worse, but somewhere further away, there's a better solution. It's the equivalent of, uh, Jordan, have you ever done mountain climbing? Uh, yeah, to, to a degree. <laughs> so when you get to the top of a mountain, is that the tallest point in the world? At that moment in time, maybe, but probably not, no. <laughs> exactly. And that's the difference between a local maxima and a global maxima. It's the close, it's the best you can find for that immediate area. But if you keep searching, you'll find a bigger one. Yeah. And it's different tools for different opportunities. Reinforcement learning is extremely good when you're able to actually say, tell your system, okay, you've done bad now stop doing this in this context, or you've done well now, keep doing this in this context, which is information you might not have access to. You might not be able to say, you might not be able to reinforce the system. When you're able to, 100% 
would recommend them most of the time over a genetic algorithm. Genetic algorithms are extremely good when you don't have data or you don't have a way to turn that data into a system where you can simply use it for generic validation. And hopefully that answers the questions at least briefly because it's a much more complicated, extremely topic sensitive uh, debate. G general genetic algorithms can be applied in any sectors. No, like I've mentioned with the tool slide, not everything can be solved with genetic algorithms. Oftentimes you could find the solution that's not even AI. A lot of the times a quick and dirty linear solution that's just an algorithm or brute force might solve the problem that you're trying to do way better, cheaper and faster than coming up with the entire requirements for an AI system, identifying technologies to use, gathering data and so on. Not everything benefits from genetic algorithms, not everything benefits from AI. It's a lesson that is hard taught to a lot of people that aren't familiar with the topic. And for data, yes and no. Like I mentioned earlier, genetic algorithms are amazing in scenarios where you can I generate sol random solutions, mix and match them together and check if they're good because that needs no data. I do, other than the requirements, I do not need to know anything else for generating a university schedule, S putting kids into different classes or getting the route from A to B. I don't need to know that to do that. However, for identifying images, for example, I could go with a neural network, but that does indeed require a lot of data. You need to have a lot of examples of this is a dog, this is a cat. This is neither a dog nor a cat. So you can identify that, oh, okay, dogs are, so it wouldn't confuse between a brownie and a dog, for example, which is again, another very popular test for that sort of system. Alternatively, which is a harder task, if you don't have the data, but still want to evolve a system that checks whether a neural network that checks whether something is a dog or a cat, you could use genetic algorithms to evolve the neural network itself, but you still need to test it against something. And that something will likely be images of dogs and cats, which would likely be enough to actually train it instead, <laughs> sometimes. And I think we're out of questions. Do we give people yeah. 10 seconds to come up with new questions? Yeah, absolutely. If anyone does have any final questions, um, please do stick them in now. I think there's um, been a, a picture shared in the chat, which is of pictures of lots of different pictures of dogs and muffins and obviously trying <laughs> to tell the difference between the two. Um, some I'm even struggling with there. But <laughs> um, but yeah, any final questions, please stick them in now. Um, but while you are, I'd just like to obviously firstly thank Mihail for yeah jumping on this webinar this evening and giving a fantastic talk. Um, coming from a non-technical person, it always amazes me how much that AI is being used on a day-to-day -day basis from your recommendations on LinkedIn, even to... I was thinking throughout that as well. I get a notification every evening to when to set my alarm for in the morning. So it just amazes me how every day there's something new that pops up that's to do with AI. And that talk was really, really interesting. Um, so really, really do appreciate you taking the time to, yeah, the build up to it, to putting in the effort for that talk. And then obviously taking time out of your, your evening this evening, obviously before a four day weekend, which is uh, gonna be a good one, hopefully. Um, so yeah, massive thanks Mihail, really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me and hopefully everyone in the audience has learned something of interest. I'm sure they have, I'm sure they have. I certainly have anyway. Um, a massive thank you to um, the audience today. Um, great to have some really good questions put in the chat there. Um, it was a really, really good talk, really good questions. And I think, Mihail, you did an excellent job of answering them. Um, if you do like webinars like this and would like to jump on more in the future, then please follow our Amicus Recruitment um, LinkedIn page and also the live series page. We're doing them on a monthly basis, whether that's AI, machine learning, Python, Golang, JavaScript, lots of different topics, lots of great speakers like Mihail. Um, so yeah, give those a like and they'll get no we'll notify you in the future of 
any further events. What I'll also do, I'll follow up with an email probably either this evening or next week, early next week with the slides from the Hales presentation today. So you've got all those links as well. Um, this session was also recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Again, I'll send you all a link um, with our YouTube channel um, so you can give it a watch back if you missed anything or wanted to recap over anything. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me a message, drop me an email, drop me a call, or I'm sure Mihail will be have an open door policy and he'll welcome any questions after this, this talk today. For sure. Perfect. Well, again, thank you very much, Mihail. Really, really good to, uh, talk. Really good to have you on this evening. And yeah, we'll definitely ha be having you back in the future. And thank you for your help. You've been a great co-host and answered a lot of the questions that I needed a lot of answers for. No worries. I thought it was going to be quite high pressure to start with, but they were quite easy questions. So I appreciate that. <laughs> but perfect. Right. Well, have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great evening. And um, yeah, see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.